This week on the Destination Angler. If you can't see the sharp edges of the rocks on the bottom, it's going to be deep enough to hold trout. Okay. And, you know, you just you just work up through these streams. Sometimes you might have to walk, you know, 50 yards or 100 yards to find the next spot. Usually it's maybe 20 or 30 feet to find the next spot that's going to hold trout. But it ain't rocket science. Mm. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back soon. Hey anglers, welcome back to another episode of The Destination Angler, brought to you by J.P. Ross Fly Rods, makers of happiness one rod at a time, get outside and simply fish. And by Trout Routes, the number one fishing app, helping you find new trout water so you spend less time on the road and more time fishing. Coming up on The Destination Angler, we explore Michigan's wild and remote Upper Peninsula and the Two-Hearted River. And then we're headed deep into the heart of the Missouri Ozarks Territory to chase their rough-and-tumble smallmouth bass. And be sure to backcast to catch the last episode of The Destination Angler on the world-famous Metolius River in Central Oregon with expert fly angler, fly tire, and blogger John Kraft with Riverkeeper Flies. The Metolius is a large spring creek chock full of big rainbows and bull trout that will challenge the best angler. You won't want to miss these shows, and be sure to hit that subscribe button to catch all the Destination Angler podcasts coming your way. And if you like the show, please tell a buddy. Today we have part one of our two-part interview with the one and only Tom Rosenbauer with the Orvis Company. And our destination is small stream fishing in the great state of Vermont. Vermont may be small in size, but large in backcountry fly fishing opportunities. And with over 7,000 miles of rivers and streams, Vermont is literally covered in wild brook trout. Tom has been with Orvis for over 45 years, where he's been a fishing school instructor, copywriter, public relations director, merchandise manager, and editor of the Orvis News. Currently, he's the chief marketing enthusiast, which according to Tom is what they call people when they don't know what else to do with them. He's a prolific writer with over 20 books in print, including the original Orvis Fly Fishing Guide, which is still one of the best-selling fly fishing books ever written. And he wrote the book on small stream fly fishing with a book called Exactly That, The Orvis Guide to Small Stream Fly Fishing. He's featured in many of the Orvis Fly Fishing Learning Center educational videos and has won numerous awards for his work and runs the Orvis Fly Fishing Podcast with millions of followers. Today, Tom gives us the rundown from top to bottom on fly fishing the state of Vermont, explains why small stream fly fishing ain't rocket science, and covers things like fly selections, rods, tippets, and leaders, and what not to carry into the backcountry so you can move fast and cover a lot of water, and other great tips from the master himself. So let's step into the stream with Tom as he dials us into the fishing opportunities in his home state of Vermont. Well, Tom, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be on the other side of the microphone. I don't have to do anything other than talk. <laughs> right, right. So I was reading uh, that you actually live on a trout stream, and I was just wondering, you know, what's that like? Is it, like, hard to concentrate on anything else? Well, uh, no, but, you know, um, it's a... It's a uh, for, first of all, it's, it's a relatively small stream, not, not tiny mountain stream but you know it's not not huge although it's pretty huge in the spring when it floods it's got wild browns and rainbows and a few brook trout that drop out of the tributaries it hasn't been great over the past uh few years it's uh, got had some uh, low water problems uh just because we've had such summer droughts here in vermont okay but it's um yeah it's great i mean i go to bed at night listening to the sound of the water when the windows are open uh, I can I can run down at any time to just look at the water, you know, fish if I want. I daydream a lot about what kind of structures I could put in there to uh, have better fishing. Although, you know, you need a backhoe, and I don't really have the I don't have the money to 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 put into the stream. But you know, yeah, I'm 
I walk the dog twice a day and, and usually fish it, you know, for an hour in the evening in the summertime. Nice. It doesn't fish well till, till the summer. And it's, it's really interesting to see the, the moods of a stream change with the seasons. And, um, you know, the other amazing thing is that even though I live on the stream and I fish it almost every day, I can never predict what I'm going to see when I go down to the river with a rod in my hand, um, huh. with any, with any great degree of certainty, you know, it's always, it's always news, always something different going on. Yeah. That's neat. Keeps you guessing. It's it kind does, of a dream yeah. of mine, to, right? Yeah. It's a dream of mine to live on a trout stream. So I, I I'm somewhat jealous. <laughs> As I was getting ready for this interview, Tom, I picked up a copy of your book that I mentioned in the intro, and uh, The Orvis Guide to Small Stream Fly Fishing, which uh, really, really well done. Uh, I learned Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, in the first, you know, couple of paragraphs, uh, it says this. It says, small stream angling is about the discovery, the journey, the unknown. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah. It is, you know, it's all about, uh, we have a lot of, as we'll talk about, we have a lot of small streams in Vermont, a lot of good small wild trout streams, um, tiny, a lot of them are tiny. And there are, uh, you know, a couple of streams or a couple of stretches of streams relatively close to my house that I've never fished. And, um, you know, I plan on it every year. I plan on a, a new couple of streams or maybe, uh, you know, areas of streams that I haven't fished before. And it's, it's always about the, the discovery what's there, you know, is it Brooks Browns or rainbows? How big are they? Um, they're generally pretty easy. So it's not about, you know, if, if they're there, you're going to catch them. They're, they're pretty, yeah. pretty stupid most of the time in small streams. <laughs> um, but it's, it's all about the discovery. And once I, once I explore one of these streams, you know, unless it's lights out fishing, I'll probably say, okay, next. And, uh, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll pick another one on a map and, and go look at that one. So it's all, it's all about the mystery and, and what you're going to find when you, you know, get away from the road and walk up one of these streams. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's really neat. And so, uh, Vermont is just loaded with streams as well, but there's a lot of other types of fishing in Vermont too, right? Can you, can you talk just about the, the broader, fishing opportunities in the state of Vermont? Yeah. You know, there, there aren't a lot of lakes. There are a few, there are a few lakes, um, more, uh, toward the Northern part of Vermont and, uh, of course, Lake Champlain. And then there's a couple of glacial, glacial fault lakes, uh, Lake St. Catherine, Lake Bomazine, south of that. And, uh, you know, a few small lakes in the area, but, um, it's mostly, it's mostly streams. Vermont is relatively, uh, mountainous terrain. It's not, they're not big mountains. They're, they're, they're old, 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 ancient uh, mountains, the Appalachians. And so they're, they're, they're short compared to Western yeah. mountains and they're more rounded, but um, you know, there isn't much flat land. And, uh, but you know, we have, we have some great fishing at Lake Champlain is just an amazing fishery. And I have a, I have a buddy who lives, lives up on Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain is about two hours from me. So I don't get there that often because there's stuff close yeah. to your home, but you know, you can catch, uh, you can catch landlocked salmon or steelhead, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, gar, carp, um, tench, which is an introduced fish. It's a kind huh. of a big minnow, uh, sheep's head, bullheads, uh, yellow perch, bluegills, uh, you know, it's got, it's like what they call a two-story lake because it's got both cold water species that go into the, um, uh, into the, uh, depths of the lake during the summer when the water gets warm. And then it has uh, warm water species in the shallows. So it's got, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. And you've got some pretty famous rivers too, like the Battenkill. What are some of the other, you know, top rivers that people might've heard of? Well, the Battenkill uh, the White River in the central part of the state, you know, the Winooski in the northern part of the state, not, not a river I'm especially fond of. It's, it's mostly hatchery supported and uh, pretty good in the headwaters, but not, you know, not, not great uh, down below. I guess the Battenkill, 
and the White River system, and then the uh, Upper Connecticut River, which forms the border between um, Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, that's a, a good sized trout stream, probably the biggest decent uh, trout stream in the state. And it's, uh, it's really lightly fished. I mean, we, we float it, uh, you know, I go up a few times a year. It, it's about three and a half hours. So it's a drive for me. It's just, you know, it right. takes me as long to get there as it does to the Catskills, but uh, we'll float, we'll float a stretch of river for five, 10 miles and not see another angler or not see another boat. So it's a, it's, it's pretty neat fishery. And it, again, it's somebody want to, wants to get away from the crowds. It's a great, it's a great place to go. Oh, that's fantastic. And um, what, what would you say, Tom, what is it about Vermont that, that makes it such an ideal setting for small stream angling? Well, lack of development, Steve, uh, a lot, a lot of forested land, you know, uh, Vermont, uh, at the turn of the 20th century was about 80% cleared because it had been logged over and uh, there were a lot of sheep farms and dairy farms. And uh, a lot of that has gone back to forested land. So it's now 80% forested. Uh, it's, it's flipped around wow. the other way. It's 80% forested it, to, the, to the point where, you know, our rough grouse hunting isn't as good as it used to be because there's too much big, big forest. And so that that um, that protects the aquifers uh, with very little development. Um, it uh, it keeps the rivers cold and clean and clear, and uh, you know just the the forested land protects the protects the uh, the watersheds. Yeah, nice. And is is it mostly wild trout in the state? Yeah, it is. It is. Vermont does some stocking in you know streams that are they're near to uh, some of the larger uh population centers like burlington and rutland and bennington but the the small stream fishing the kind of stuff that i really like to do these streams are too small for anyone to bother stocking uh because hardly anybody fishes them you know it, it's not right. it's not worth spending money to put trout in there thank god because they can <laughs> they can support wild trout uh, there are there are a few places uh that they put uh, fairly large stock fish, they call them trophy fish fisheries, and they're they're mostly kind of um, marginal trout streams. In other words, they get kind of warm during the summer. But uh, the uh, Walloom Sack in Bennington, uh, East Creek in Rutland, uh, Otter Creek between Manchester and Rutland, and the Black River. Uh, a little bit further north, uh, near Woodstock, Vermont, uh, those those rivers have a, a stock a trophy stocking program where they put these big stupid fish in there, and um, you know it, it kind of it's kind of nice because it kind of draws the draws a lot of the anglers toward those streams and keeps them off that that you know people that are just looking for big trout, um, easy trout, and so they they don't pay much attention to the the smaller streams that have wild trout in them. Okay. So they go to those streams then. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I read about Vermont that was really interesting is are your, your stream access laws. Is it, is, am I right that it's actually kind of, you can walk on any property and fish. Is that right? Yeah, really. It, it, it is. It's, it's not, you know, I, I, it's funny. It's funny. I've, I've always understood that Vermont has access, access laws like Montana where mm -hmm. um, the riparian zones are, are in the public trust. And once you get into a river at a, a road crossing, or whatever, you can, you can wade it wherever you want. I can't actually find that law on the books, but it doesn't really matter because in Vermont, it's kind of just accepted that you don't post your land for against fishing. Really? In other words, you'll see you'll see a lot of posted signs in Vermont. Not a lot, but you'll you see posted signs, and they they invariably will say no hunting, shooting, or trapping. They say nothing about trespassing or fishing, and it's just not done. You know, it's just it's just if you're if you're a Vermonter, you just don't keep fishermen off your land. It's just kind of kind of an accepted practice, but I believe it's also, I believe it's also a legal, 
a legal thing, but um, you know, some someday I'll I'll find the I'll find it in the state regulations somewhere. But anyway, it's really open, and you can you can fish any stream you want in Vermont. Yeah, it, it, maybe that has something to do with a strong sense of community from people who live there. Yeah, I think so. That's yeah, really cool. It's a, you know, a, occasionally, occasionally someone from, you know, from down below, as they say, or a city person will come in and buy a piece of property and um, you'll fish up through their, their backyard and they'll, they'll try to tell you, you can't be there. And you'll say, sorry, <laughs> you better, you better look at the laws. <laughs> better check it out. Yeah. So I was in Colorado last summer and came across this really incredible app called Trout Routes. You know, if you've ever looked for a good map to help you with anything from public access to finding the best trout streams in a given area, I highly recommend checking out Trout Routes. Trout Routes has mapped out every stream by state with very detailed access maps for every stream. And they have over 15 different map layers with hundreds of thousands of access points. They also have local fly shops, ability to take notes, and even local stream regulations, and you can download maps for offline use. Today, Trout Routes covers 23 states, including Montana, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, West Virginia, and more. And they will be adding 10 more states this year, including states like Utah and New York. So if you have an upcoming trip or looking to explore nearby streams, I suggest you check out Trout Routes today on your Apple or Android phone. Don't leave home without it. Hi everybody, this is JP from JP Ross Fly Rods. We're happy to support Steve and sponsor the Destination Angler podcast. Do us a favor and check us out on our website, smallstreamflyfishing.com. JP Ross Fly Rods and Company has been around since 1997. We've made thousands of fly rods with one purpose, helping you get outside and be happy. So check out our line of small stream fly rods like our Muir, seven foot, five piece, three weight e-glass. Our famous Beaver Meadow series of rods starting at five foot, two weight. And don't forget our six and a half foot, three weight, four piece. And now our new Beaver Meadow S-glass, six and a half, two weight, three weight, all the way up to eight foot, five weight, all in four piece. Check us out, please, at smallstreamflyfishing.com. And thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you on the water. So back to your, your book, um, uh, the, I think it was the first chapter that really kind of talks about like, what are small streams and why yeah. you should be interested. And I was wondering yeah. if we could kind of start there. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah. You I mean, what I consider a small stream is, is a couple of criteria that I use. One is that it's no wider than a, than a, a, a two, two lane road, um, you know, standard two lane road, yeah. um, and smaller than that. And and it you know it's a stream that it's a stream that not many people fish you know it's it's a stream that doesn't have isn't on the internet um, it isn't famous uh, you know it's it's up in the national forest somewhere and it's just a blue line on a map. Nice, and and you had you had some info on there about why you should be interested in this. I think it's probably pretty obvious. I mean, this sounds great to me, but what is it about small stream angling that that you love? Well, it's. First of all, I don't I don't like fishing near other people. I'm not I'm not a social angler at all. And, and when I fish when I fish a big river, I will stay away from people and I will I will keep moving until I find a a place where there's nobody around. So I don't like I don't like jabbering with people on the river. I don't like being an earshot of another person. And when I go to one of these uh, small streams, I guarantee that I'm not going to see anybody. So that, that's important. No boats, you know, you're not, they're, they're too small to put a boat or a raft on. You're not going to have people floating down with inner tubes. You're not going to have a drift boat coming through your water. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's the solitude and, and also it's the fact that they're easy fish, Steve. Um, you know, you, you can get yourself respect back. Um, you go on the <laughs> bat and kill, you can go on the bat and kill and, and, spend a day and not see a fish rise or see a fish rise and not, not able to catch it because it spooks and, or you can't, you can't get the right fly. Whereas when you go to a small stream and you make cast into a little pool or a little pocket, you're either going to hook the fish or you're going to spook it. 
they're either going to take it or they're going to spook. There isn't a lot of food there. Uh, they're they're very opportunistic. They're very aggressive, and um, you know you just you, you can catch a lot of fish. It's fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's all about the it's all about the rise, you know, the rise or the hit on your on your nymph. It's it's all about that. And um, you know if if you want to spend a whole day catch fifty fish a day on one of these little streams. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. It kind of reminds me of, you know, some of the alpine lakes, you know, out west. You know, you can you can find an alpine lake like in the Beartooth that nobody's been in there all year. Yeah. And like the fish are stupid and you can catch 50. You have to like keep moving. It just gets so stupid. They're, you know, they follow you around in some of those lakes I've found. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a it's a, it's a numbers game. I, I don't know. They're they're also they're also beautiful. The fish are you know, and small streams are invariably really brightly colored because they're wild. Even the brown yeah. trout, you know, brown trout are not known as a, a beautiful trout, but uh, brown trout in a small stream, some of them are just gorgeous. And of course, the brook trout are gorgeous. Right. And, you know, if you can find a small stream with rainbows in it, there are some in Vermont, uh, not as not as common as brooks and browns, but there are there are a fair number of streams with um, wild rainbows in them. They're gorgeous, too. They're cl- the fins are clean, you know, the fins are clean. They're not beat up. They're just beautiful little gems. Yeah, totally agree. So what advice could you give anglers coming to Vermont on how they could find their own streams? You know, can you kind of break the state down for us a little bit? Like, where would they start? Yeah, far northern Vermont, I'd say north of Burlington, um, is uh, they're a little bit more uh, infertile, acidic streams because of the the bedrock there, and uh, it's going to be going to be a lot of brook trout, and yeah. uh, you're going to find you're going to probably find a lot of beaver ponds, which you know can be sometimes good, sometimes bad, depending on you know how hard you want to thrash through the brush. Sometimes they'll produce bigger fish. Sometimes they'll warm the water a little bit too much when they start to silt in ah, but sure. you'll find you'll find a lot of uh you'll find a lot of brook trout up in that area and then as you come down the uh central part of the state you probably want to stay away from the for trout fishing you probably want to stay away from the the champlain valley um it's a okay. it's a big broad valley and um, heavily uh heavy agriculture area and uh, most of the little streams there are too warm. It's one of the few places uh, where, you know, the, the little streams are going to be kind of muddy and full of uh, farm effluent. Not not great. But, it, it, you know, f- from the central to the eastern part of the state, um, nearly, you know, once you get up to a little bit of elevation, any any trickle of water is going to have at least some small brook trout in it. Yeah. And when you get closer to the Connecticut River, which would be in the far eastern part of the state, some of those small streams that flow into the Connecticut River have populations of relatively large, large trout that spend some time in the Connecticut River getting fat on, uh, you know, crayfish and minnows and things. And then will go up into those smaller streams when the when the Connecticut gets too warm or in the spring uh, and fall spawning season, spring spawning season for rainbows and the fall spawning season for browns and brook trout. Uh, Actually, you wouldn't find many brook trout coming out of the Connecticut River. They'd be browns or rainbows. Okay. And then, you know, in in the southern part of the state, there's actually two mountain ranges. There's the Green Mountains, which go down the central part of the state. And they are uh, older, um, more, uh, insoluble, nice and schists and, and heavily metamorphosed rock, uh, quartzite. They're, they're not as rich. Uh, they, they have some, uh, there's some pretty good brook trout water in the green mountain streams, but they're less fertile and they're less likely to, to support brown trout. So they're going to be mainly uh. brook trout streams. But when you get over to the Western southwestern part of the state that's the taconic range and these are um also old mountains but they're totally different uh, geology they're more uh limestone marble bedrock 
which uh, has a lot more uh, calcium and magnesium in the water. And that, uh, that stimulates more growth, more aquatic insects, uh, more springs because the rock is more porous. And so you have cold water and you have more productive water. And there you're going to find streams with um, more and bigger brown trout in them, oh, as well as brook trout in the headwaters. Okay. And the, the southern part of the state, is that, is that pretty good for, for fishing as well? Yeah, I think the, I think the small stream fishing, in this, of course, I live in the southern part of the state, so I know it better. Um, the small stream fishing in the southern part of the state is probably uh, the best south, uh, you know, central to southern part of the state uh, in the small streams is probably the best small stream fishing in Vermont. Well, there you go, folks. There's some great tips from Tom on how to go explore Vermont. Thanks for offering that up, Tom. I wanted to shift and talk about, you know, some of the technical aspects of small stream fly fishing, because once again, this book that you, you published is just fantastic, really gets into a lot of great tips there. And, um, I wonder if, if we could start by talking about reading water and approaching small streams. Like, what would you say to anglers? What kind of tips would you have for us there? Well, see, the, the cool thing about small stream fishing is that there are no technical. There are, there are no real, <laughs> there's, it's not technical. Right. For, first of all, fly selection is, is relatively unimportant. You can, you, you pick a big dry fly, like a size 10 or a 12, or maybe a 14, that you can see that looks buggy. So that would include a, you know, chubby Chernobyl is my favorite, but uh, stimulator, parachute atoms, uh, wolf patterns, anything that you can see that floats well and looks buggy. And then you tie a piece of four or five X tippet on the end of that fly, about six to eight inches of five X tippet, and you tie on a size 14 nymph of your choice. Um, you know, a pheasant tail, a hare's ear, any, yeah. any of the, any of the, uh, Euro nymphs that, that people love and, and you just go fishing. Uh, it, you know, it's dry dropper is, is the best way to go. Um, because, uh, you know, you can fish a nymph and a dry at the same time. And you'll either find that most of the fish take the dry or most of the fish take the nymph or sometimes it's 50, 50. And, um, uh, that's pretty much all, all you need to do. And the, uh, also reading the water is not rocket science. It's any place where the water's deep enough where you can't discern individual rocks on the bottom. So it's like about two feet deep or maybe a foot and a half, two feet deep. If you got water that deep, if you, if you can't see it, if you can't see the sharp edges of the rocks on the bottom, that's going to be deep enough to hold trout. Okay. And, you know, you just, you just work up through these streams. Sometimes you might have to walk, you know, 50 yards or hundred yards to find the next spot. Usually it's maybe 20 or 30 feet to find the next spot that's going to hold trout, but it ain't rocket science. <laughs> They're going to be where you expect them to be. You know, when you come to yeah. a big pl waterfall plunge pool and, um, you know, there's going to be a bunch of trout in that pool. So yeah. it's, it's really, it's not hard. One of the great things about small stream fly fishing is that it's simple. Yeah. You know, and the tightness of small streams kind of freaks people out, but you, you don't false cast. You know, you, you make, you make one quick cast with a short line or a roll cast. And uh, very few of these streams are, are so overgrown that you can't get a cast. I mean, they're, you know, they're yeah. mountain streams. They're, they have a, you know, most of them have a relatively open flood plain. Yeah, there's going to be trees along the edge. You're going to get caught in the, caught in the trees. But um, people, people worry too much about that. It's part of the game. And uh, it's not that hard. Okay. I was listening to your podcast from this week, Tom, and you had Pete Kutzer on there. You guys yep. were talking about a bow and arrow cast. And I thought that's yeah. perfect. I'm sure yeah, you're, you're doing some of that. Special bow and arrow cast. I don't use bow and arrow cast much. I I generally can 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 find a place to do an over you know straight overhead cast. Um, when yeah. you're in a small stream, you're generally working upstream, Steve, and you're fishing straight upstream. And there's usually a nice clear lane in front of you and behind you because you're sure. you're right going with the river. So not that hard. 
um, you know, there's the occasional place where you need a roll cast and yeah, yeah. There's occasional place where you want to get into a little tight pocket and you use a bow and arrow cast, but, uh, you know, generally you could just get away with a standard overhead cast. Okay. And do you, do you size your rod down a little bit in a small stream? Yeah, it's just more, more fun with a lighter, smaller rod because the fish aren't going to be very big. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the thing. The fish are, you know, an eight incher uh, is going to be a pretty decent fish in a lot of these streams. So you got to love, right. you got to love, just love trout for themselves and not worry about a trophy. <laughs> uh, there are places when you might occasionally catch a 10, 11, 12, even 14 inch fish, but it's going to be rare. Right. Yeah. A seven, you know, seven and a half foot for a four or an eight foot for a four is kind of my go-to rod for small streams. Okay. Yeah. You don't need a super short rod and it's act. I think it's actually a detriment to use like a six foot rod because, uh, you, you often need to hold line off the water to prevent drag on your sure. dry fly and your nymph and a six and a half foot rod. You don't, you can't hold much line off the water. So, um, and you, you know, the other thing is you don't really need a special rod. You need a rod that can cast in close well. And so that, that is going to be a, a relatively slow, lightweight rod. Um, or if somebody doesn't want to buy a new rod, not that I, not that I want to talk anybody out of buying a new rod cause I work in the tackle <laughs> business, but, um, you know, you can even get away with it with a uh with a nine foot rod in a lot of these tiny streams and one of the things that you can do because you're casting so short is to overline the rod by one line size or even two line sizes so if you have a okay you know if you have a nine foot for a four weight uh rod or a eight and a half foot for a four weight or whatever um you might want to put a five or even a six weight on that rod because the slightly heavier line will make that rod bend at a, a shorter distance. Gotcha. Most fly rods are optimized for about 35 feet of fly line. And uh -huh. so when you get into casting 10 and 20 feet of fly line or less, sometimes just the leader, a lighter fly rod, uh, a fly rod with a, with a heavier line will, will work better. It'll make the rod work more at short distances. That makes great sense. Fiberglass rods are great for this kind of fishing because they're, they're slower by nature and they can't, they cast really well in short bamboo rods are great for this kind of fishing because they, they flex more, uh, with less line outside of the guides. Yeah. Love that. And are you shortening up your leaders too? Like assuming you're doing like a seven and a half foot leader versus a nine foot. Seven and a half foot leader, seven and a half foot leader is about perfect because your drifts are going to be really short. Your cast is going to be short. Your drifts are going to be short. And so, yeah, seven and a half, I start with generally seven and a half foot four X. I tie my dry fly to that and then I go from there. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And you talk about just, um, you know, since you're on the move, right? I mean, I think part of the key is, is being mobile. Yeah. So you, you, you need to dress accordingly, right? Like don't bring everything you normally bring when you're fishing, you know, the Madison or something, right? You want to lighten up, don't you? Yeah. When I'm on, when I'm on something like the Madison or the Missouri, I'll have at least six or seven fly boxes because then you never know what you're on a big river. You never know what you're going to encounter, whether it's a hatch or you need to fish to a switch to a streamer or whatever. Um, so I'll, I carry a lot of fly boxes because I'm a fly tire too. I mean, I love experimenting with new flies. When I'm on a small stream, I take one fly box and it's got, it's got a, you know, a bunch of dries, uh, a bunch of nymphs, probably more than I need. You really only need a couple, a couple of flies. You can put them all in. Yeah. It's you just know, which ones. <laughs> you don't need, you don't need much. Um, and you know, I'll throw a couple of little streamers in there just in case I, I hardly ever use them on small streams, but, uh, yeah, just a, a hip pack or just put stuff in your pocket is um, is all you need to do and you need maybe yeah. two spools of tippet material um one of that one of the things i always carry are uh 
are uh, the uh, white desiccant fly float, the uh, re retreating, because you need to be able to see that dry fly. It's either your it's either your lure or it's your indicator for the nymph that's hanging below it. You need to be able to see it. Yeah. You need to be able to see where it is. Not so much that you need to be able to see it for the strikes because the strikes are usually pretty splashy, but you need to see where that fly is drifting. So I'll always carry a desiccant floatant with me. And, you know, snips, paraforceps to pinch barbs and take hooks out if you need to. That's all you need. Okay. And just for people that may not have heard of desiccant floating, what is that exactly, Tom? It's a, it's a, uh, I think it's, it's a ground up sodium silicate, I think, but it's a, it's a white powder and it comes in various names, uh, fly shake and, and, and dry your fly and Shimazaki float. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a white powder. Yeah. Stuff works great. You, you want to have that with you. And that, that's about all. Waders are, are typically not necessary. Uh, you know, it, once the water, once the air temperature gets up to, you know, May and June levels, uh, right. I just wear a pair of wading boots and then a pair of quick dry long pants. You don't want to wear shorts because you're going to be, you're going to be going through brush and you may have bugs. Vermont doesn't have a lot of mosquitoes and black flies like some other states, but you know, you want to wear long pants, just just a pair of nylon or poly quick dry pants, a pair of good wading boots, you know, because you're going to be doing a lot of walking. And uh, I guess you want to wear muted colors because these fish are fairly spooky. I don't pay a lot of it. I don't wear camo or anything, but you probably don't want a bright, uh, you don't want a white shirt or bright yellow. You want something that's tan or green. Uh, this so that you blend in a little bit. That makes sense. Let's talk about food sources in small streams because it's a vastly different game than in a in a big western river, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, the fish the fish definitely will eat uh, mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies, and those occur in these small streams. But the thing is that they they seldom see a a, a hatch of one kind of insect. They, uh, you know, the, the flies dribble off all day long and, uh, the fish are just looking for something to eat. They're, they're not going to be selective at all. And the other, the other really important thing is that a great part of the diet of these fish in small streams are terrestrial insects. So beetles, okay. beetles, yeah. moths, crickets, inchworms, um, and the fish, the fish never see any one particular terrestrial. Uh, so you just need something that looks buggy. You don't even, even, you don't need to fish a specific grasshopper pattern if you don't want to, or you don't need to fish a beetle because the fish are, fish are just looking for stuff. And so, uh, you know, like an elk caddis. Uh, is a great small stream fly. I think the fish take it because it looks like a moth. Um, it may it may look like a little stonefly or caddisfly, but they see a lot. They eat a lot of moths too that just fall in the river. So um, so you don't you don't need to worry that you don't need to agonize at all about fly selection. It, it, would you say like a, a trout in a small stream like that that? A trout may eat a beetle, and then 10, 10 minutes later, eat a moth, and 10 minutes later, eat an inchworm? Exactly. Or do they zero in? They do. Okay. Yeah, huh. exactly. And you'll you'll seldom, I mean, it, it, occasionally, you will see a hatch, and you will see fish, you know, rising in um, in, a, in a bigger pool. Uh, it's rare, in, in my experience here, and in most small streams, it's pretty rare. And then they can get kind of selective. So, you know, I always have a little you know, some little blueing olives or, or something with me, but I almost never use them. And the, the thing is that these fish eat dry, will eat your dry fly all day long and you'll never see it rise. Right. If you wait to see fish rising, you, you know, you, you're going to wait all day, <laughs> yeah. but you throw a dry fly out there and they'll eat it. Okay. What, what's your favorite beetle pattern? I don't even use beetles in these small streams. I just use, I just use stuff that I can see like a, chubby chernobyl or a elk air caddis um i don't i can't it's hard to see beetles 
on the water, and I don't think you need one. I do, I have occasionally used a big parachute ant, or sometimes a parachute beetle, but I don't think you need it. Okay, interesting. And how big of an ant pattern are you using? What size? Oh, like a 12 or a 14. Pretty good size ant. Oh, big. No yeah, kidding. Yeah, big. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's big carpenter ants, you know, in the in the forest. There's a lot of big black carpenter ants. Yeah. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessary. One of the things you one of the things that that works pretty well is to use a sinking ant or a sinking beetle. You know, just um, either one that doesn't have a parachute, doesn't have much hackle on it, and just let it sink. Don't put any fly floating on it. Or you can actually tie or buy uh, sinking ants and sinking beetles that will that will work. But Again, Steve, you you don't need to you don't need to specifically imitate any given insect in these streams. Oh, that's great. Do you like those epoxy ants? I've used those a few times. Nah, that's too fancy for me. Is that right? Okay, just let them sink, huh? <laughs> too fancy for me. You know, like I said, I generally uh, stimulator or chubby Chernobyl, a, a decent sized dry fly that floats really well, foam body dries work great any any of the hopper patterns will work too even though these fish in these mountain streams don't see a lot of hoppers but that doesn't matter they'll eat a hopper and then a generic nymph hanging on the back of a pheasant tail a hare's ear a copper john you know any of the pop prince nymph works really great any of the popular nymph patterns will work huh no kidding what do you suppose even with a pheasant tail imitates a mayfly what do you suppose trout are thinking there yeah, well, there there are there are mayflies in these streams. There there are mayflies and and little stoneflies and big stoneflies. And the okay. you know the fish see them and they eat them, but they, again they don't see any one particular type. Okay, and a prince can can imitate a lot of different things too, right? Who knows what a prince nymph looks like? Doesn't look like anything <laughs> in nature, but it works. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with it. It it catches fish. That and a woolly worm. One of my best small stream nymphs is a, a red copper john in a 14 or a 16. There are no oh. red there are no red nymphs in these streams, uh, but it works. Huh? No kidding. And you're talking about red. You're talking about the uh, instead of like a copper back end. You're talking about a red back end. Yeah, red red wire. Make it out of red wire instead of out red of copper. Wire. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's a good tip. So if if I'm a new angler, I'm coming to um, Vermont for the first time. Yeah, you know what what should I be thinking about? You mentioned a lot of different flies. Like as I'm approaching a stream, just try something and then switch it out if it's not working. Or what would you suggest there? Yeah, um, if it's not working, there's probably no fish there. I mean, let's uh, you know if if you're if you're in, from the middle of May to the end of October, and you're fishing a small stream. And you're not catching anything, or you're not even getting a rise. Yeah. Either you spooked them, or there's nothing there. Okay. Early in the season, when the water's cold, you know, when the water's below 50, below 45, 50, you can sometimes not have the fish move to anything other than a, a nymph really deep. But once the water war once the water warms up, and that's when most people are going to be here, right? Is summertime. Yeah. If you're not catching anything, you're either not quite stealthy enough, you're maybe making moving too fast, making too much commotion, or the fish aren't there. Interesting. You're gonna hook them if they're if they're around. Are, are those the, the 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 mistakes that most anglers are making if they were making mistakes on small streams? Just what you mentioned. Yeah, I think uh, a, a, a few things. One is they they may not be moving fast enough. You, you don't want to belabor a pool unless it's one of these big waterfall plunge pools. If it's just a little pocket uh, that's a little bit deeper than the rest, you want to spend about, you know, four or five casts in there. And you've either spooked the fish or, well, it could be they're not hungry, but that's probably not the case. You've either spooked the fish or there's nothing there. So you just move on. Right. And, you know, you should be covering, you know, in an hour of fishing, you should be covering a uh, half mile of water. Okay. Boy, I find so often that anglers, uh, you know, just, just like you said, just they stand in one spot and they hammer a pool just for way too long, even in a 
in an alpine lake or in a regular river. It's like, keep moving. I don't know. That's always worked well for me. Yeah, I mean, that'll work in a place like the Missouri or the Madison or the Bighorn where you know you got fish in front of you, right? And you're yeah. just trying to figure out what what fly they're going to eat. Um, that, that works there. You can spend all day. I have spent, you know, hours and hours on the Bighorn of the Missouri standing in one spot. Uh, but in a small stream, no, nah, you don't, you, you want to move. Keep moving. You gotta, you gotta like to walk. You gotta like to hike. The other thing that people do is they look at a stream close to the road where it crosses a road and it looks too brushy or it looks too shallow. And so they move on. But a lot of times if you get out of your, park your car, get out of your car and w- walk, either walk, start, you know, walk upstream hundred yards and then start fishing. Sometimes they'll open up. Sometimes you'll, you know, as it increases in elevation, you'll get some beautiful pools. Or the other thing to do is to uh, get out of your car and walk way downstream away from the stream through the woods uh, and then work upstream. Okay. I mean, working upstream is the best way to go. It's too easy to spook fish when you, when you walk downstream. So upstream is the way that, uh, about 90% of the good small stream anglers that I know, uh, fish upstream. Okay. And let's talk about, you know, how you find, you know, that where's the biggest trout in a given pool. You, you talk in your book about prime lies. I wonder if you can say more about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're going to be in the best spot. They're going to be probably in the deepest spot. That's got the most cover. So they're going to be close to the biggest rock. They're going to be close to the overhanging branch. Uh, they, are you know, the bigger trout, uh, will push the smaller trout out and they're, they're going to be in the best looking spot. And again, it's not rocket science. Just look at a place that, that's a little deeper and a little more protected than the rest of the places. Um, and, uh, you'll find the bigger fish. Okay. How much do, uh, water temps come into play for you? Well, that's interesting because most of these streams don't even really fish super until midsummer until like, like middle of June through the end of August. Um, they're pretty cold. As you know, they're close to they're close to groundwater. They're close to the source um, of of the water, and they stay pretty darn cold. Unless you're yeah. down in a unless you're down in a valley where you're fishing a meadow stream, um, the fish are going to be a lot more active as the weather warms up. So the be, the best fishing is really in the middle of the summer. Yeah, for sure. What are these trout doing in the winter when there really aren't terrestrials? What are they eating all winter? Well, Steve, that's a good question because Vermont, uh, up until this year, has had a closed season from the last Saturday or the uh, last day of October until the second Saturday in April. Uh. So I don't know, but uh, generally, they're what I suspect. Um, having fished other streams in states where you can fish all year round is that they're not feeding much. Yeah. They're, they're going to, uh, they're gonna, you know, when the water temperature warms up a degree or two in the afternoon, if you get a warm day, they may pick at a, a, a stonefly that drifts by or, or, you know, there are, there are mayflies in there. There are caddisflies, um, and they may feed, but they're probably not going to be feeding much. They're going to stay in deeper water close to the bottom. They may even drop down, uh, into a, into a bigger river, uh, for the winter time. Huh. But we have had a really cold weather here this winter since, since we, we opened year round just January 1st of this year. Uh, and it's been too cold. The rivers have been either iced over or full of sl- uh, slush ice. So it hasn't, it hasn't been really conducive to going out there and seeing what, what they're doing, but, um, you know, ants and beetles, ants and beetles start getting active pretty, pretty soon in the spring. Okay. But, uh, you know, there are little stoneflies that hatch during the winter time. There's a little black stonefly and there, there are midges that hatch. Uh, so they're, they're probably feeding on that stuff. Interesting. Again, I don't, I don't think you need to worry about imitating a little black stonefly or a little midge. 
if they're interested in food at all, they'll take a bigger thing too. Right, right. Well, that's it for part one with Tom. Come back next week for part two as Tom shares more about his life of fly fishing. And thank you for listening. Be sure to check out our Instagram and Facebook pages for some great photos Tom sent me. You can DM me or email me with comments and suggestions at shag50 at gmail.com. And if you like the show, please give us a share, like, or follow wherever you get your podcast. As always, our music is by A Brother's Fountain. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again soon. Tight lines, everyone. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go From the land to the shining sea But I know, I know, I know, I know There's more to life than what the eye can see